So, hi, good morning. Thank you for attending this session and thank you, Ariana and Ricardo, for your kind introduction and more importantly, your invitation to participate in this interesting session. Um, it's my pleasure to open up this session with two talks. So, I'm afraid, apologies, that you we are going to listen to me for 40 minutes. Um, but I'm going to present research that I hope you will find useful uh, that Francesca and I are doing at the Italian Space Agency in the Scientific Research Unit. The first talk will be more an overview of the current digital methods that the archaeological remote sensing community is, uh, is using at the moment uh, to track looting, uh, to monitor and quantify this phenomenon. The second one will be instead a more focused paper on, uh, on a case study in Syria that Francesca and I have studied for five years now. So we all know what archaeological looting is, so it's something that is happening. Uh, and I just linked to Ariana's presentation. It's something that crisis, political instability situations, warfare um, can favor. But it's just important to know that archaeological looting is something happening also in ordinary times and is linked to economic, social and cultural factors of the country where this phenomenon occurs. You may think that it occurs only in poor and developing countries. That's not true. Uh, probably already you have seen in Ariana's presentation a UNESCO map showing uh, uh, the trafficking roads, uh, which basically matches with this map. That's uh, only an, uh, a sample of situations that we have found recorded in social media rather than in scientific publications or in the grey literature. And as you can see, it's pretty ubiquitous. And uh, you can imagine uh, uh, why remote sensing is very helpful uh, to track this phenomenon, to quantify it's a spatial and temporal spread from remote. Uh, the talk is about towards best practices. I'm not going to give you today best practices, but I'm going to outline the current state of the art and the situation where we are at the moment as a community in terms of digital methods in remote sensing and image processing. Um, based on which uh, uh, Francesca and I think that we are in the position to move as a community towards best practices. Talking about communities is a pretty vital community, it's made by both scientists with different degree of expertise in uh, image processing, but we have also practitioners. Uh, in a second I will show you um, some projects around the world where practitioners are fully involved in uh, using these remote sensing technologies. Uh, because um, at international level, uh, we have already a common understanding of the usefulness of these technologies as an objective source of information, allowing a, conserv a conservative estimate of their condition on the ground. So there's no doubt about that in the community. But interestingly, different groups are using different data and this reflects the fact that we have a plethora of satellite uh, uh, space missions that are providing data. There are different methods that at the first approximation we can subdivide in manual, visual, image processing based and automated or semi-automated. And I can tell you in the community we are debating uh, the degree of automation uh, versus just the image processing based methods. Uh, for sure, in terms of mapping archaeological looting, there are established methodology. Um, Ariana was mentioning before, Yamina is the one of the best examples at the moment in the international community where uh, we are establishing methods uh, uh, calculating also the accuracy and the error that we tend to, um, to make when measuring looting. But there's something interesting uh, uh, at the moment that probably we need to work on more. Uh, sharing knowledge and consolidating methods. Interestingly, I will show 
you know, some example later on, uh, different groups have developed different methods, but we have the evidence that at the moment these methods are poorly disseminated across the community. So outside the group that have developed these tools, we are still a few evidence that they have penetrated in the, in the community. Uh, Ariana was referring to uh, political instability events that may trigger um, a looting or a, a favor the spread of looting. Um, it's interesting that uh, we are doing this study and uh, hopefully it will be published soon. We have tried to correlate uh, um, the trends in the specialist scientific research publications with some of the key events uh, recalled in the, in the previous presentation. And this is a confirmation that looting is uh, happening anyway. And there was already back in the early of this century an interest in research groups in uh, developing methods based on satellite data to uh, measure looting, to monitor looting. So as you can see, uh, the trend is uh, continuously growing. So we have uh, more and more publications um, and in some way, the events uh, that have made this phenomenon pretty known across the social media have uh, generated an impact in increasing the attention and therefore the use of satellite data. But to be honest, uh, this is something that was already ongoing. Uh, I was mentioning before uh, some of the projects. So we Amina in the UK, but also Acer in America, uh, Antiquities Coalition, UNITAR, uh, several projects, several international initiatives that are using satellite data. Um, but interestingly, we are not limited and constrained in just observing this phenomenon. We are moving as a community to interpret the observations that we are making. Interestingly, the outputs are pretty different depending on the scope of study and also the, the scale of the observations. So I just uh, report here three examples from the very recent uh, scientific literature and as you can see we have uh, examples uh, in the top uh, left uh, an, anthropo an anthropology study based uh, uh, on the evidence of severity of looting across the old country of Syria uh, linked to the various type of occupation or uh, groups uh, that, have, that have been uh, the major players in looting. But also there are studies uh, trying to predict the extent and severity of this phenomenon. So you can see that observations is just the starting point uh, towards a more interpre interpreted uh, output. Uh, moving to satellite data, in the study that we have just submitted, uh, we have analyzed that all the publications starting from 26 up today, uh, just to see how uh, different data from space missions are used. Of course, the majority is optical data, so in the visible um, bands of the electromagnetic spectrum, mostly from commercial um, uh, providers like Digital Globe at very high resolution. Um, most of these studies um, propose the use of this data with a clear defined methodology for mapping, which is mostly based on manual mapping and visual detection and identification of looting features. Uh, still, a uh, few publications are dedicated to combine optical data and radar data from synthetic aperture radar space mission, and even less publications are using radar data at very high resolution, less than one meter or one meter, uh, to develop an automated or a semi-automated method for identification and mapping. So there's a split in the community at the moment. So some considerations. There's no unique method. I will show you now some of the key methods that we think uh, are pushing forward this technology. Different data are used by different groups. And this is an opportunity, but at the same time, we are not sharing the same methodologies. Uh, I have already mentioned very high resolution, less than one meter optical imagery are predominant in the literature. 
but uh, synthetic aperture radar is uh, rising higher in the agenda because there are uh, papers uh, coming out showing how to access this data because uh, in the past one of the problem was how to access this data uh, although there were already several uh, space missions providing also for free this data uh, and also how to process them um, interestingly I will show you a case especially in this second of the, uh, these two talks about the use of high resolution optical data interestingly uh, data with 5 to 30 meter special resolution has been perceived by the community as not useful as a very high resolution. But I will show an example uh, just to prove that this depends on the scale of mapping and on the size of the meeting features. So we need to be uh, more open-minded and not work with, with data just because we put higher emphasis uh, on the special resolution. There is another key point, temporal frequency of observations, because uh, looting is something very dynamic. I will show you an example in Apamea, uh, in Syria, and there you can see an increase of looting rates uh, um, month by month. So you need the data uh, sometimes that are acquired very frequently. And not all the missions provide these uh, for free or uh, with no cost of reproduction. Uh, there were some barriers, uh, I have to admit. Uh, some of the very high resolution images are still very costly. Unless they are accessed through visualization platforms, the, the most common Google Earth, but it has uh, some limits, of course, because it's not frequently updated. It depends also on the area. You may have just one or two images. Um, but there are some agreements uh, with providers, but again, frequently they are very exclusive. So not all groups have, act, have access to large amount of this data. There are open access data. I will mention later on the Copernicus Sentinel-2 optical imagery at high resolution data that are free uh, for everyone, but because uh, they are at high resolution, have been uh, for now not used at all in the community. Uh, the community is actually moving from uh, site scale uh, studies uh, to more systematic regional efforts because uh, we have seen already in the previous presentation that and in some of the previous slides that looting is affecting entire countries so we need uh, to have uh, diachronic and synchronic um, uh, points of view of this phenomenon especially at regional to national scale um, one of the good things, uh, in especially in establishing methodology based on visual and manual mapping, is that we are aware of the sources of error. I will mention this uh, later on, because uh, identification of feature uh, related to looting requires a lot of expertise, because I can tell you, and I will show some, uh, some examples, they can be confused with other unrelated features. So this is important if we want to provide uh, a quantitative estimate. So, Quantitative estimate that means also uh, sources of uncertainty and error. Uh, and as I said, there's a lack of evidence that methods are shared, and this is uh, something uh, that we need to work on. Uh, let's start with the visual and manual methods, the, the most common. I just uh, cite here the work by Sarah Parkak, probably you know her, uh, from uh, her very famous papers uh, in, done in Egypt. Uh, they draw basically individual polygons over each looting pit. Uh, you can understand that this is a very accurate method, but, is, but this is also very time consuming. And because um, uh, sometimes when you look at features, you have also to distinguish between uh, real looting features and other uh, features that are probably natural like soil stains or plants that appear similar you have also to consider that this quantification is the lowest possible count of looting pits so it's a very conservative estimate but this is done because there is of course an expert knowledge capable also to distinguish between older and fresh looting pits because the looters tend to um, to come back and repeat their action uh, several times. So it's not a one-shot uh, uh, activity, uh, I'm afraid. And if you have this continuous time series, like for instance in Google Earth, 
it's pretty easy that you miss uh, some of the new looting features and uh, miscalculate them assuming that they are new but instead that they have already uh, been made uh, by looters in previous dates compared to the date of acquisition of your image. So, in my opinion, uh, we are at the point where the expert knowledge uh, trained uh, by manual and visual methods uh, needs in some way to feed into automated detection chains. Um, why uh, this need? Because if we look uh, particularly across the last decade, uh, that, uh, several uh, groups have developed and published different methods which, however, uh, share some commonalities because they are based on spectral and morphological properties of looting features. I mean in particular the fact that looting feature in an arid environment has a different um, spectral signature. It's usually, as you have seen in the previous slide, um, a black hole surrounded by um, a lighter ground and this is particularly important, I will show you in a second example in vegetated areas. Other groups have used uh, the size, uh, the circularity index. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my colleagues from the National Research Council of Italy are not attending today the session because uh, uh, they have developed an interesting automatic uh, uh, method called the ALFEA based on spatial autocorrelation and the similarity based on um, on this variability along the edge. Interestingly, all the groups are developing their methodology workflows in commercial software. So meaning that the sharing of these methodologies is feasible because they can be shared in RGIS or in NV. So it's interesting that there's the ground and scope here uh, to disseminate these methods. Uh, we have seen that uh, case studies uh, in arid environments, but looting is happening also in vegetated contexts, even in the Middle East. Uh, this is Apamea and Syria. And as you can see, there's a contrast effect, uh, pretty distinctive, because uh, uh, looting holes uh, appear as an alteration of virgin, uh, unex unexcavated uh, uh, soil. So we can use not only the visible bands, that so far have been mostly exclusively used by groups uh, in mapping uh, looting features. So we can use also different channels. So the red and the near infrared also to derive some spectral indices. Uh, the very common spectral indices that we are uh, quite used to use uh, uh, in archaeology. So EVI, red dead and DVI. And as you can see, just an example, uh, the, um, the false color infrared uh, image just uh, emphasizes and answer the spatial spread and distribution of looting features. So maybe uh, using different combination of uh, bands and channels we can also change the rationale for selecting data because uh, if we know that a site is a heritage hotspot um, interested by looting uh, we can also plan the acquisition with different rationales in this case, even a seasonal approach where we know that seasonally the site uh, is vegetated and uh, we can have a better visibility of the features. And as you can see in this uh, uh, zoom detail, uh, you can also uh, differentiate between the older looting pits on the right with the fresh new looting holes on the left because uh, we know, it's pretty known in the literature, uh, weathering of these features are bringing uh, this feature becoming less visible, even in very high resolution imagery. Uh, spectral signatures are key in, uh, at this stage, in my opinion. I just uh, recall a paper that has been published in one uh, special issue that uh, we have uh, edited last year, uh, by um, the Cyprus uh, Technical University group and interestingly not all spectral indices are adequate for all the cases uh, and that's uh, something we need to, to work on. Uh, we may think that NDVI or EVI or leaf area index because they are common indices 
they, uh, they work uh, appropriately and successfully uh, in every context. In this context, we are in a rocky, partially vegetated area in uh, Cyprus, and interestingly, the group has developed uh, some uh, um, uh, a, a complex methodology, including the use of vegetation indices, but they were basically derived from built-up indexes uh, uh, portfolio. Uh, I'm moving quickly about the optical eye resolution data because the next talk will be focused also on the use of this data. Just to mention that the European Commission has a huge health observation program called Copernicus and Sentinel-2 constellation made of two satellites acquiring every five days at every point on the Earth is providing for free this data uh, that in the visible and near infrared bands is at 10 meter and 20 meter in the sphere bands. So you can imagine the type of uh, analysis that, that we can do over large spatial coverage a single frame. So we can start even uh, if not with the same detail in mapping as allowed by very high resolution data, uh, we can do that especially if we want a, a synchronic view of the various type of looting. I will uh, present this uh, case study in the next presentation. Uh, I'm just uh, closing this first talk, mentioning that there's also radar. Uh, radar nowadays is providing a sub-meter to meter uh, level of data both from the German and Italian space agency and of course mentioning the Italian space agency constellation first um, also because we have an advantage we have four satellites instead of two in the case of German Aerospace Center and interestingly we can reduce because we have this constellation formation the observation even to one day so you can understand how we can task the satellite to very highly frequent uh, uh, observations um, I will come back later on this, uh, how looting features are observed in very high resolution star imagery um, and how we have modeled uh, the different uh, appearance uh, of looting goals depending on their size, orientation. Uh, this is also based uh, on, the, on the evidence that uh, particularly in the Middle East uh, these features are made by looters in a systematic way using bulldozers in some cases or uh, heavy machinery so these features um, basically define some patterns, very distinctive patterns that we can also model and uh, observe um, in particular just extracting the texture because uh, in radar, looting goals are an alteration of the surface roughness. So you imagine a virgin soil uh, that has not been excavated yet is normally nearly flat. But if we have uh, looting goals, uh, this is an increase of surface roughness. And therefore, based on this geometric and morphological property, we are able to extract the position uh, of new looting goals at the very high detail, in this case at one meter resolution. And we can also build uh, some interpretation keys uh, that include not only evidence of new looting goals, but also backfilling and reworking. Uh, that's something that in the literature, in the literature has been over, overlooked, because the looters tend to, uh, to repeat uh, their action, and sometimes uh, new looting goals uh, backfill uh, uh, the previous ones. Um, so I'm just skipping this uh, slide and then moving to the conclusions. So which are the levels at which we believe that we should work to disseminate uh, these methods and going to the definition of best practices? First level, satellite data selection, because uh, the evidence is that different groups are preferring different data and this uh, is mostly related to the specialist expertise. So who's uh, able and uh, more comfortable in using optical data tend only to use uh, optical data and vice versa, star data only. Uh, but we probably need to move towards combination. Um, there are some open questions. In the table that I showed you with the automated methods recently developed by different groups, uh, groups have tested this, these methods using different type of processing levels. Someone have uh, used uh, panchromatic, so the highest resolution possible. Others have uh, put their emphasis on the spectral signature, 
others on the data fusion products. So that's something we need to work on. Uh, at the level of image processing methods, there's currently an emphasis in the community between who's working with automated methods and who's working with manual and visual methods. Uh, they are not exclusive. Uh, in the, our point is that visual and manual methods have established a correct and accurate methodology for mapping. We need to use this expert knowledge to better improve the automated uh, detection chains because, uh, of course, uh, as Arianna recalled in the previous presentation, there are a lot of false positives uh, in the analysis made with automated change detection. And finally, the outputs. I've just showed you very quickly different ways to present the output of these observations. Um, they are all equal, so I'm not saying that one is better than another one, but probably we have to, to think about if there's a need or an opportunity in attempting standardizing these outputs. So we, uh, we took the same language and compared different case studies. Thank you.